All right, welcome everybody to this video on endogenous retroviruses. My name is Donnie Badinsky, and this is part one or episode one of an ongoing series where I am going to be responding to a video put out by Stated Clearly. John Perry is the one who uh, runs that channel. He has uh, two, two channels. And so the video I am going to be responding to in detail point by point is titled, Did God Put Endogenous Retrovirus DNA in Our Genome? And so this is a topic that I have studied extensively, and I want to leave no stone unturned on this issue of shared endogenous retroviral-like sequences in the biological world. The reason why is because numerous proponents of evolution or guardians of common descent have argued, they've asserted <clears throat> that endogenous retroviruses are as, cl uh, as close to proof as you can get for evolution and uh, universal common descent. And so I want to uh, tackle all of the relevant videos, especially those uh, related to the ongoing creation versus evolution debate. And so this, again, is going to be more of a series as John Perry, who I appreciate. I appreciate him engaging this topic. His video is uh, technical. It's, it's thorough, and therefore it deserves a, a thorough <clears throat> and worthy response. And so we're just going to go go through it uh, point by point, sentence by sentence, if we can. And he is going to be responding to a couple comments. So I guess a little bit of background on this. Uh, going back a few years ago, Matt and I, we did a response video to John Perry's video put out on the Stated Clearly YouTube channel focused solely on endogenous retroviruses. He ended up doing a response video as well to that. This is going back a few years. And he also put out this video. And so this video he gives, if I remember correctly, he gives 11 reasons why all ERVs are truly, truly the result of uh, past viral infection. I like to point out the important question pertaining to this ongoing debate of ERVs. And I like to ask the question, are these really the ancient remnants of past viral infections or are they created units of DNA function? And so John Perry, his case and his position is that they are not created units of DNA function. He provides 11 reasons why they are not created units of DNA function. And so in this series, again, I'll probably do it in uh, probably three parts. And I'll answer every single one of his uh, points. And so with that, I do want to just get right into it here. Thirteen questions about evolution with John Perry. Evolutionary question number twenty-five: Endogenous retroviruses. How do we know they really came from viruses? A little while back, I published a new animation over on the Stated Clearly channel about endogenous retroviruses, and these are retro. So this is the video that we responded to. Again, going back a few years now, time flies by when you're having fun. And so I've done a lot since then on the topic of endogenous retrovirus, uh, endogenous retroviruses. I've written a book here that you can see the endogenous retrovirus handbook. And so this is comprehensive. This answers the questions related to the shared mutation argument in the ERV like sequences. It addresses the argument from nested hierarchical patterns and homology, and also the question of function. <clears throat> I've done several formal debates, open mic challenges, informal discussions, technical discussions on this topic. We just put out a video responding to Vice Rhino <clears throat> as well, who has a video out there 
<clears throat> claiming that ERVs are the best evidence for evolution, that kind of evolution that says humans, banana plants, and whales are related through common ancestry. Because remember, if by evolution, you mean changes in allele frequencies, an allele being a genetic variant, and frequency being the frequency that that genetic variant occurs in, in a population. And so changes in allele frequencies in populations over generations, we're not going to disagree with. If by evolution you mean dogs and wolves are related through common ancestry, again, we're not going to have an issue. But by evolution, they mean the theory of evolution, large-scale evolution, that bacteria-like organisms slowly over time evolved into humans, chimpanzees, whales, banana plants, so on and so forth. This universal tree of life that says everything goes back to common ancestors. That's where we have an issue. And so in my previous response to John Perry here and in my book, debates, discussions, so on and so forth, I demonstrated that uh, ERVs, the majority of them, <clears throat> and we'll get into that as well, what we mean by the majority, are created units of DNA function. God did uh, front load these DNA units. This goes for all kinds of uh, transposons, various classes of retrotransposons or retro elements, which endogenous retroviruses are one of those types of DNA elements. And so God front loaded in the original created archetypes all sorts of functional DNA elements to help with adaptation, to help with DNA variation so on and so forth. So these are beneficial DNA elements. We know this uh, for many reasons. One reason being the amazing functional roles associated with endogenous retroviruses and endogenous retroviral-like sequences. The, uh, a few of those functional roles involve embryological development, determining cell types, gene regulation, gene expression. They act in the immune system cell stress responses, viral mimicry. And throughout this three-part series, we'll go in, into all of those uh, functions in detail. Now, I'd love uh, John Perry to provide me with a paper that shows a non-functional endogenous retrovirus going from non-functional to something essential in the function of a living organism like embryological development. I want empirical evidence for this, not just storytelling or evolutionary philosophy, right? Because they'll oftentimes just assert co-option or beneficial mutation accumulation without any evidence. Viruses, so retroviruses are a special type of virus that inserts its DNA into its host DNA. They actually start out with an RNA genome, convert that into DNA, insert it into the cell. And when that cell reproduces, the DNA of the virus will be reproduced as well. And so now both the daughter cells have a copy, identical copy of the virus genome. They can make viruses, pump out viruses, and, you know, the, the virus reproduces. Well, if they get into a sperm cell or an egg cell, the child that develops from that sperm or egg cell, if a child does develop from them, will have the virus genome in every single cell of its body. And then it will pass the virus genome onto its kids when it has kids. Our genome, the human genome, is filled with virus. Right, so he's talking about vertical transmission. You have exogenous retroviruses, and then you have endogenous retroviruses. So endogenous just means occurring from within, exogenous occurring from outside horizontal transmission. A good example, a well-known example of an exogenous retrovirus is HIV. And so HIV is passed along horizontally, but for endogenization to take place, you'd have to have an exogenous retrovirus infiltrate in the right way, in the right spot. So in a germ cell line, a reproductive cell. And from there, it can be passed on vertically. And so if it's passed on vertically, as John here said, and I do appreciate how informative he is in this video, I'm going to have a lot of fun uh, responding to this, then every single cell of the offspring will, will have it if it's passed on to progeny. And so this brings us briefly into the 
uniqueness of retroviruses. Because in order to do what they do, in order to be able to infiltrate genomes and hosts, is they have to perform what's called reverse transcription, right? We all know basic genetics, DNA to RNA to protein. So DNA transcribed into RNA translated into a protein. And so reverse transcription is basically that process of transcription, but in reverse. So instead of DNA to RNA, RNA to DNA. And so the genetic material associated with the retrovirus is RNA material. And so the retrovirus, which John Perry is going to discuss, the components or structure of a retrovirus, which is the same as an ERV, a full ERV that is, is you have LTRs on either side, long terminal repeats. And then in the middle, you have your gag, pole, ENV genes. And these um, code for important enzymes and specific genes for specific enzymes. One of those is reverse transcriptase. And so this is the enzyme of a retrovirus that can convert the RNA to DNA. So that's how the retrovirus can perform reverse transcription. And so basically when the viral RNA gets converted into DNA, the DNA can be read by the host machinery. And from there, it can be transcribed to produce viral RNA molecules. And so this is the way the retrovirus works to infect and infiltrate. And so from there, some of these molecules will make their way to the ribosome, which is where the ribosome will then read that genetic information, producing proteins needed to assemble the viral capsid, as well as the other viral enzymes, which John is going to discuss in this video, uh, protease, and then also integrase, and of course, reverse transcriptase. And so integrase is going to be key in understanding the integration process of these retroviruses. And so let's continue here. Genomes, we call them endogenous retroviruses because they are in us from the start. So I did a video about this on the Stated Clearly channel, and I've gotten a lot of Right, so they occur from within. He said they're in us from the start. That's why the question is, since we're observing them. Now, in this response video, I'm going to do limited slide, slide uh, presentations because I've done so many slides, hours and hours and hours worth of comprehensive slideshow presentations. I want to do more so as if we're having a discussion and I am just responding to uh, all of his points. And so I don't want to always be going to the slideshows, but you can definitely uh, see those slides in past videos. And so the point here, now I will go to slides and visuals at certain points, especially when it comes to the DNA function, but I'm going to keep it a little more free flowing here. And so the question really does come down to the fact that are we dealing with DNA units that got there from past retroviral infection, okay? Because your evolutionary community will admit that for the most part, we are looking at the these sequences, these chunks of DNA, these stretches of DNA. They're there. They're present. We didn't observe them becoming integrated or part of the genome. It's mostly inferring these, these infections, original infections would have happened millions of years ago. And so that's why it is an important question. I do appreciate the title of his video. Did God put endogenous retrovirus DNA in our genome? And I would argue that yes, for the most part. Because I will point out, as I have in my book, which I wrote a couple of years ago, so this isn't new, there are true endogenous retroviruses. Okay, but that's the minority. And we'll get into this throughout the video questions about some of the details that were not covered or were sort of quickly gone over in that animation. It was a 
very quick introduction to endogenous retroviruses and how they can be used to make evolutionary trees because you can actually see that you know humans and chimps for example share a bunch of endogenous retroviruses and those were inserted before the chimp human split so here are the questions well some of the questions i've gotten a lot of them i'll probably be doing a couple of videos on this today i'm combining the questions that i got now remember, humans and chimpanzees and other primates, they do share endogenous retroviruses and endogenous retroviral-like sequences. Why I say, say ERV-like sequences is because as we're going to see throughout these response videos, is that the vast majority of so-called ERVs that we share, the thousands and thousands, simply represent solo LTRs, long terminal repeats, and they actually lack the key components of a retrovirus, which would be your uh, GAG, pole, and ENV, ENV standing for an envelope protein, uh, elements of the retrovirus, okay? When it actually comes to full ERVs, there's really on the, only a few compared to the solo LTRs that we find. And so if these are created units of DNA function and we share them with, with chimpanzees and other primates, then that's not surprising. We would expect if they are essential, if they are necessary, if they are important to living organisms and necessary to sustain healthy life processes, then we would expect through, just through common design that all organisms would share these in the same way that all modes of transportation have an engine in common, which is necessary. You need an engine in the same way that you need a brain, you need a heart, you need a liver. Okay, so there are systems, there are organs, there are parts to a living organism that aren't as essential or necessary for life as the heart or the brain, but that doesn't make them non-functional or insignificant. And we're going to find that with ERVs is many ERVs, like the ones involved in embryological development, are necessary for our, our existence <clears throat> and life in general. But many are also very important, but not essential in the sense that without them, you, you would die. I mean, I got two hands, two legs. You have an appendix, which harbors good bacteria and is very important. But a lot of people get their appendix removed. A lot of people get things removed and they can still survive. If I lost my right hand, I still got my left hand. Doesn't mean my right hand isn't important. Doesn't mean I don't need my right hand. And that's the same thing with ERVs is there are many different functional roles associated with these ERVs. Some essential to life, others still very important, but not as essential as ERVs that are functional in determining cell types or embryological development. Yeah, from two different people. One of them is YouTube user MM. How do we recognize that a portion of our DNA is an old contamination of a retrovirus? And then Rodrigo asks, could it be that the things we call endogenous retroviruses are actually just parts of our DNA that God put there at the moment of creation? Now, once we understand how it is that ERVs are recognized, ERVs is endogenous retroviruses, but it's easier to say. So <laughs> once you know how ERVs are recognized in the genome and you think about it real carefully, you'll realize that they can't tell us. And that's another thing. The ERV or ERV-like sequence did not name itself. It did not call itself endogenous retrovirus. That is what we are calling it. Very similar to pseudogenes, which we now know many pseudogenes are important for cell processes. I've done whole videos on pseudogenes. They are not all broken genes, okay? And so it's misleading and deceiving in many ways in many ways with the whole argument from junk DNA, pseudogenes, ERVs, ELU sequences, so on and so forth, because it gives off the impression, oh, endogenous retroviruses. So they must be the result of ancient exogenous retrovirus or viral infection. Because when people hear virus, they think bad. When in fact, the majority of viruses that exist in and on our bodies and on the planet are good. You wouldn't want to live in a world, and this comes right from the secular literature, the conventional literature, you wouldn't want to live in a world or on a planet that doesn't have viruses or bacteria. 
for that matter. Bacteria and viruses are incredibly important for many reasons, for our health, for the ecosystems, the billions and billions and billions of bacteria that exist in and on our bodies. If I remember correctly from my study into this topic, there are more viruses in and on our bodies than there are cells. And yet we comprise about 40 trillion cells. And so many have pointed out that these viruses, clearly they're not killing us. Most are good. Most are important and essential. And they are actually regulating the amount of bacteria that exists in and on our, our body. So when you hear the word virus, don't think right off the bat something bad. Okay. And that's why in this series, we are going to talk about the bigger picture and the bigger picture results in a question that I've challenged other people like Vice Rhino to answer. I haven't gotten an answer back. What is the origin of retroviruses? Because as we know, retroviruses require a host to replicate. So what came first, the host or the retrovirus? It can't be the retrovirus because then it would require a host. The host comprises cells to replicate. And that's why the creationist has the best explanation, because God creates hosts. He creates original created archetypes or kinds, including Adam and Eve, the first couple, the first two human beings, and front loads them with high levels of genetic diversity. That's the created heterozygosity or design diversity hypothesis, and also front loads living organisms with many different types or classes of functional units of DNA, like what we refer to as the pseudogenes, ALU sequences, ERVs, okay? And so this can explain this supposed paradox or chicken and egg problem because the ERVs, for the most part, were front-loaded at the beginning in the original created kinds. But over time, you have what's called escapees. We're simply through environment, through deleterious mutation accumulation, through errors in the packaging process and recombination and just defects in general, you have harmful retroviruses originating from healthy host cells or healthy ERV sequences. And from there, they can cross species and in another species, pass on horizontally, they burn hot and fast because that host can't regulate the retrovirus. And so from there, it leads to disease and oftentimes uh, death as well, depending on how dangerous the virus is. And so the point is viruses in general are good. Most of them are good but yet we do have some bad ones. And the creationist has the best explanation for retroviruses in general, where they came from. And so I'll reiterate my question for John. I'd appreciate an answer. What is the origin of retroviruses? I'm not necessarily interested in evolutionary philosophy or imagination or just so stories. I want some empirical evidence. I want some good evidence, a good answer. According to the evolutionary model, where did retroviruses come from? How did they evolve? What did they evolve from? What were their precursors? What's the evidence for it? And what came first, the retrovirus or the, or the host? Because retroviruses require hosts to replicate. Very important question. It's the bigger picture question. Whether or not God exists, right? but they actually can tell us whether or not they were put there <laughs> at the moment of creation or not. So yeah, we, we will examine those questions here. The information that I'll be giving you, a lot of it comes from this book. It's a really great overview of just, you know, the past 50 years of the study of these things. And it's by John Coffin, Stephen Hughes, and Harold Farmus. John Coffin actually was the main researcher who advised me on that video. So it was really cool being able to work with him. It turns out that if you read his book, he doesn't really divide things like, like I do here, but there are 
11 different ways, independent ways that we can tell that ARVs really came from viruses. So the first one, we're gonna go through all of these one by one. The first one, ARV protein genes match those of retroviruses. So here's a little sketch of a retrovirus. There's the outline of a So I wanna go back real briefly. I'm excited for this series because we're digging in deep. We're getting into the details. This isn't necessarily just the repeating of the ERV argument like we see in a lot of debates where you have evolutionists who look up, what's the best evidence for evolution? ERVs pop up, pseudogenes pop up, chromosome two fusion pop up, pops up. You know, these arguments that I have spent a great deal of time on, because again, I wanna focus not necessarily on the non-discriminatory or agnostic lines of evidence, which are important and we need to focus on those. We gotta be knowledgeable on those and up to date. But I particularly, want to spend a lot of time and focus on these arguments that the evolutionist claims are the best arguments. Again, you have evolutionists when it comes to ERV saying this is as close to proof of something, evolution being the case, as you can get. Because in, in uh, science, you don't necessarily prove something. It's about having a, a hypothesis and a theory and doing whatever you can to disprove your, your idea or your theory, okay? And see if it withstands the test of time and testing. And so the point here is we want to look at what they believe are the best arguments, and then we want to dismantle them. Because if you take away their best, what are they left with? Not very much, are they? And so this is their supposed best. And so this is interesting because John Perry, he's uh, listed very nicely here, 11 reasons why, according to a slide here, we know for a fact they came from viruses. But again, as you're going to see for the great majority of them, and we'll see in his video, if he addresses the counters to these or the answers, we've already discussed these in great detail. I know I've got whole sections on these, most of these in my book and in my lectures on the topic. And so notice the first one. ERV protein genes match those of retroviruses. Okay, well, I've pointed out many times that your endogenous retroviruses, they do share sequence similarity with exogenous retroviruses, right? You got your LTRs on either side, GAG, pole, ENV genes. Okay, they require the sequence similarity. They require the similarity in protein genes to retroviruses to actually carry out their roles in fighting off invading and harmful viruses because they act in cell stress responses. They act in the immune system. They are in many ways a form of defense in our bodies. Okay. And a big one is viral mimicry. And so there's actually researchers, cancer researchers and scientists that are currently, they have been for a little bit, working on drugs that stimulate what's called P53 activity. So P53 is an incredibly sophisticated protein in the genome. It is referred to, you'll see in the conventional literature and referred to by many as the guardian of the genome. It does, does performs many incredible roles. And the P53 protein actually acts or it's involved in an important function related to ERVs. And this is called viral mimicry. And so researchers are looking to stimulate P53 activity and the transcription of ERVs in uh, anti-cancer therapy. And the reason why is because these ERV elements they are playing a role in tumor suppression, okay? And so they do this through what's called viral mimicry. And to perform this role, one of these many functional roles, amazing functional roles, they require the sequence similarity to the retroviruses. And the reason why is because when the cell is under stress, transcribed ERV elements, they give the appearance of being invaded by a viral infection, a retrovirus. And so as a result, this targets that cell 
okay, because it looks like it's being invaded by a retrovirus, it targets that cell by the immune system more destruction in order that that cell, which in the case of a tumor cell, is destroyed. Because tumor cells, as we know, can oftentimes in, uh, evade uh, the immune system where the immune system has a dip, difficult time detecting these tumor cells. But this amazing mechanism of viral mimicry, okay, performed by the ERV, mediated by the P53, this incredibly sophisticated protein that I would love to know, evolutionists, how this evolved through natural selection, mutations, and other evolutionary processes. So this mechanism is a way for those tumor cells, which largely go undetected by the immune system, this is how they can become detectable by the immune system because now the cell is giving the appearance of being invaded by a retrovirus. And so this enables the immune system, the amazingly designed immune system to clear those tumor cells from the body. And these ERVs could not perform this amazing functional role if they did not have protein genes that match those of retroviruses. That's the whole point of viral mimicry. It's like you get a cop or a detective that wants to infiltrate a gang or a mob. Well, he's got to look the part. He's got to mimic the part. He's got to look like the mob or the gang. If he shows up in his police outfit or his uh, detective uniform with his name badge that says, hey, I'm Dave and I'm a police officer and I'm here to infiltrate. Well, you know what? He's not going to last very long. He's got to look the part. And so these ERVs need to look the part. And so that's why they have to look like the retroviruses that they are mimicking. This is amazing design. And another reason is again, it goes back to the bigger question. What is the origin of retroviruses in general? And so if retroviruses, harmful retroviruses originated from host genomes, but the ERVs and the sequences associated with ERVs were pre-existing, then the evolutionist is looking at this backwards. The retrovirus looks like sequences within the host genome or parts of the host genome, which comprise ERVs, because they originated from the host genome. So they're taking those parts and components with them as they move from host to host. Okay. So these are very important uh, points to understand. Another important role for the ERV and ERV-like sequence is fighting off invading viruses, harmful viruses. And again, they do this. And these roles are frequently dependent upon their similarities to those retroviruses. And so right off the bat, number one fails. And he chose this as number one. Does that mean he thinks it's the best one? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe the, these are just random. But no, this is not a good argument for why we know ERVs really come from, from viruses. And again, the opposite is true. The data actually suggests that your viruses, your retroviruses originated from host genomes and may have originated from pre-existing functional created DNA units like your uh, retro elements, one being the, the ERV, okay? And so another aspect of ERVs has to do with our immune system pathways and the immune system of the growing baby. In embryological development, for example, ERVs are safeguarding the baby, the growing baby, from invading viruses. These are very important functional roles, and this is exactly what we'd expect from a good designer. And so why do they look like viruses? Because the components, the elements, the traits associated with these functional ERVs, these important ERVs are necessary to carry out their functional roles. A good designer would design them that way as God has in order to perform what they do. And so again, this is, this is excellent design.
Okay, there are the proteins associated with the ERVs. They can actually interfere with incoming viral particles. So you have the, the viral particles coming in from the bad virus and they interfere and stop. They're defending against these uh, viruses. So let's, let's see how he explained this a bit. Of retroviruses. So here's a little sketch of a retrovirus. There's the outline of a retrovirus. Retroviruses. Have and I got to say, this is a well edited video. I've enjoyed listening to this. And I think the images are great. John, although wrong on this in evolution, he's, he's an excellent teacher. We just got to get him on the creation side, the right side of this. And so why the biblical creatious explanation, the model I put forth is so robust is because again, it also answers the bigger picture question. So what I love about this visual, and I appreciate it uh, here, John, is in his argument here that ERV protein genes match those of retroviruses, he gives us a good glimpse into how the ERV or retrovirus in general is built. So like I was saying earlier, you got your gag or pro genes, okay? And you've got your pole genes and then your ENV gene. So ENV standing for elevo, uh, envelope protein. And then your uh, virus RNA, that's the genetic material. That's why reverse transcription is uh, important and necessary, RNA to DNA, okay? Well, what's interesting is these envelope proteins, again, every aspect of the ERV is important to carry out their operational roles. And so the envelope protein, for example, they actually function in blocking harmful viruses from entering. And so they contribute to that function alongside the other components of the ERV and how they do this. And I've done full presentations on this, looking at a paper, if I remember correctly, um, a 2021 paper which goes into these uh, functional roles associated with with the immune system and so what they can do is actually bind to receptors that the infectious viruses might use to enter the cell of the host and so again these are all defense mechanisms it's good design and so these env proteins what they have the potential to do is enter your bad viruses that are coming in okay and that interferes with the virus life cycle. And so it stops it from doing any harm because it's essentially inactivating the viruses before they infect new host cells and before they can do any real damage. And this all came about through evolutionary processes. Oh, endogenous retroviruses. They're just... You know, we share them with the chimpanzees. Yeah, of course, because the chimpanzees also require defense mechanisms. We all live in similar environments. We all share the globe. We all exist on this earth. That's why, you know what? My computer and John Perry's computer probably both have antiviral programs. And if we're smart, we have good programs that fight off these viruses and keep our computers clean and smooth and running nicely. Okay. And so, no, ERV protein genes match those of retroviruses. And so they must have come from retroviruses. Not at all. It's not a good argument. I mean that in the nicest way possible because these proteins that are encoded by these ERV sequences, they actually amplify, they strengthen, they heighten the immune system that we are designed and built with in order that immune system responses can act quickly and swiftly to clear the body from bad viruses. This is incredible. This is why I love studying this topic. It's a great time to be a biblical creationist, guys. When their best so-called evidence becomes one of our best lines of evidence, you know it's a good time to be a biblical creationist. Praise the Lord. Have RNA for their genome. You know, I've got this, this little coiled up RNA inside the actual virus particle. It's gonna go try to infect somebody here. And here I have the same genome kind of laid out in schematic form. And I've got it divided into three big chunks. People will divide the, the genome into several different ways, but I've divided it in well, 
four chunks, a little tail on the end there. A retrovirus has a segment that codes for GAG genes, so group antigen genes, and then a protease. The group antigen genes, those are the proteins that form a little capsule around the RNA genome. And some of them bind actually to the RNA. Some of them form a shell around it, an extra coating around it. And then there's a protease, which just protease is a protein that breaks apart other proteins. So these are the proteins that he thinks because they match those of retroviruses means that ERVs came from retroviruses. But as I've explained, yeah, these enzymes are important. Protease, integrase, reverse transcriptase, okay, the envelope proteins. They're necessary. Even if we just had viral mimicry, which is not the only function that we have, that's enough to dismantle this argument because they have to look like the retrovirus in order to perform viral mimicry and allow the immune system to target those tumor cells and destroy them. But yet that's just one of the many. And so I do appreciate John Perry giving us a, a good technical breakdown of these important points when it comes to ERVs. Because a lot of people, ERVs, this might be new. It's a technical topic. It's not necessarily the easiest topic to uh, study and understand. And so it's important that we get a breakdown and that we assume that the viewer knows almost nothing about ERVs. And so let's explain what an ERV is. Let's show you what a retrovirus is. Let's tell you why the guardians of common descent believe they're good evidence for evolution. And then we dismantle it. Then there's another segment of the genome that decodes for the polymerizing proteins. There's a really special protein that retroviruses code for called... So right there, those are your polymerizing proteins. You got the reverse transcriptase, which I explained earlier is very important in terms of converting the RNA to DNA. And then once it's DNA, then the uh, cell or the host machinery can convert that to what? RNA. Because now it can actually be read by the uh, host DNA and then transcribe to produce viral RNA uh, molecules. And then you've got integrase, and that's necessary for the integration process, which is exactly what it sounds like. This is how the virus integrates into the genome. But one thing that the evolutionists won't tell you is that you have these transposons, okay, and this is going to counter some of his arguments later, but here's a sneak preview. You have these transposons or mobile elements where they can actually move around in the genome and affect gene expression, gene regulation, help produce variety, uh, genetic variation to be passed on. And so from one chromosome to another, or move along that chromosome through cut and paste means or copy and paste means, we'll get into that either a little bit more into this video or the next video. And so in order to do that, within the genome, internal movement, internal functions associated with these transposons, they require the integrase and the reverse transcriptase to do this. And so your evolutionists, though, they'll look to scars or marks associated with the integration and assume that this is evidence of external infection coming in from the outside. When you get those same scars or marks or signatures, through internal mobility of these transposons. And this is just another one of the amazing functions associated with these. Reverse transcriptase. That's what, when, when, these, when these viruses reproduce, they actually make a copy of their RNA genome into DNA, and then they insert that DNA into the cell. They actually slice a part of your DNA, pull it apart, and they insert their genome, a DNA copy of their originally RNA genome into your DNA. That integration happens with this enzyme called integrase. So you've got reverse transcriptase and integrase. They're very important. Then last but not least, we have the envelope genes. You've all heard of spike proteins by now because of COVID. These are the things that are on the outside of something like the coronavirus, and also HIV has them, the flu has them. They are the things that stick to your cells and allow the virus to break into those cells. They stick to the outside of your cells and help it, you know, get inside. There's a bunch of different envelope genes that are coded for in a retrovirus genome. 
and all of those are also found in ERVs. So this is an excellent visual. I appreciate it, John. This is great. And so you have your ERV genome here. Yeah, so your ERV is going to be flanked by your LTRs, long terminal repeats. Okay, host gene on, on either side. GAG, your pole, and then your ENV genes. Okay, so these, these proteins that code for the uh, integrase, protease, and reverse transcriptase. But notice the retrovirus. Same thing, GAG, pro-genes, pole, and then your ENV genes. Okay, this matching, <laughs> this sequence similarity, again, does not demonstrate that ERVs came from retroviruses. Firstly, I've shown, going back to the bigger, question, uh, bigger picture question, that harmful exogenous retroviruses, the evidence best suggests the escapee hypothesis that they originated from host genomes, Okay, so no surprise that they look like the ERVs, which are pre-existing and created, front-loaded. And one way we know this is because of their amazing functional roles, which, as we pointed out with their functions in the immune system, viral mimicry, just to name a couple, and even retrotranspositioning, okay, these uh, transposons, the ones that are actually mobile, they require the sequence similarity. So yeah, it makes sense that a designer would incorporate these functional DNA units into the genomes of living organisms to perform those functional roles. And they require that specific makeup and those uh, specific components. Yeah, so this is great. I like the way that he's uh, compared these. So the evolutionist sees these comparisons and they think common descent. They think, oh, these retroviruses must have come, or these ERVs must have come from ancient the ancient invasions of uh, retroviral uh, retroviruses. Well, no, that's not the case. So these chunks of DNA in our genome, in the human genome, that look just like virus genomes, we call them endogenous retroviruses, they have the GAG pro genes, the pole genes, the end gene. They require the GAG, these chunks of DNA, these stretches of DNA require the GAG, the pro, the pole, and the ENV to carry out their roles. The sequence similarity doesn't, doesn't prove your point, John. So hopefully the next 10 are, are better than this. Means they've got all of them and they're in, you know, similar orders. Now, if you start reading papers on endogenous retroviruses, you will find claims that, you know, the human genome, 5% of it is endogenous retroviruses. Some people will say 8% of it is endogenous retroviruses. And the reason that you see different numbers in different places. Well, some of it's because we've discovered more of them. Yeah, I've got some visuals here on my slides. So transposable elements in general, about 45% of the genome. Transposons, 2.8%. Retro elements, 42%. And then you have your LTRs, okay? So that's what your ERVs would be, LTR, retro elements, not non-LTR. Okay. And that was, so you got your class one ERV, class two, class three. It's about 8%, you know, five to eight, like he said. And so here's your signs, lines. Those are different types of transposable elements as well. Retro transposon, these are all the specific makeups. Endogenous retroviruses, LTR, LTR, GAG, pole, ENV, exactly as he's been uh, explaining here. Uh, same thing, host DNA, host DNA, LTRs on either side. And again, we're going to get into in detail, probably in the next uh, episode, um, why these uh, so-called ERVs, most of them lack these components and just represent LTRs, solo LTRs, and not true endogenous retroviruses. They are assuming that these were once part of full ERVs, but over time, through mutation accumulation and recombination that all that's left is the LTR because the other uh, components that comprise an ERV were essentially lost or broken down. Okay, so the vast majority, again, they lack the GAG, the pole, the ENV, and all we have are solo LTRs. And yet we know that these solo LTRs, these long terminal repeats, I've got paper after paper demonstrating this. We're going to go through it in this series. They serve as what? 
binding sites for initiating or enhancing gene expression. Very important. Okay, gene expression, what's that? It's the process by which a gene is turned on to produce either an RNA or a protein because you have a lot of you DNA to RNA. So you get an RNA product and then that RNA uh, product is functional. You don't necessarily get the translation into a protein or you get DNA to RNA to protein, you get a functional protein. Okay. And so most of the genome doesn't code for proteins, codes for RNA. Most of the genomes involved in uh, regulation. We understand there's genome wide activity. I've done many presentations on uh, junk DNA demonstrating that this genome wide activity, about 80% is not uh, spurious or just noise. And we'll probably at some point get into uh, that in this series. And so when an evolutionist says, oh, we share thousands and thousands and thousands of these with the chimpanzee, most of those are simply the uh, solo LTRs. Why are we even going to call those solo LTRs ERVs? They're just functional stretches of DNA that are there for many reasons. A couple of those reasons being uh, gene expression, involved in uh, gene expression. So, okay, let's go back to the video here. Them. As time goes on, we, we keep discovering new endogenous retroviruses. But also another reason is that some people might be only counting an ERV if it's a complete ERV. The whole thing is there. Some people might count it if it's only partially there. Because what happens over time is these things mutate. So I've kind of darkened out some spots here to show the mutations. And this, this one is, uh, it's pretty mutated in my sample here, my example here. But the whole thing's intact. You'll have Sometimes you'll get a mutation that knocks out a big chunk of one. And, and then you'll get some mutations that are actually pretty common where the the white part here, the part that I've drawn are white, the, the tail on the right will connect to the tail on the left. And actually the whole thing will get sliced out. So that happens. But some people want to count any chunk of an ERV as an ERV. Others only, only count it if the whole thing's intact. Yeah, I think it's most scientific to not call your solo LTRs, your long terminal repeats that are not a part of your full ERV where you actually have the gag, the pull and the ENV, I wouldn't call those ERVs. That's misleading. <clears throat> you can call them functional stretches of DNA, but we know that those solo LTRs serve a functional role in the genome and they act in gene regulation. We understand they can function as promoters and serve as transcription factor binding sites. And so, okay, if we look at the structure of the retroviral material, the LTRs serve in important ways. They serve as promoter sequences and serve as binding sites for RNA polymerase. It's critical for transcription. And so when you see just the solo LTRs, God placed them there to perform functional roles. They do a good job in retroviruses and ERVs. And so those can also be used to perform a good job elsewhere and in other ways in the genome. This is just basic. And so I think it's misleading to call your solo LTRs ERVs. It does, it's not a full ERV. There's about, uh... Again, this number keeps growing, but if you look at the, the databases right now, you'll find that there are about 9,000 complete ERVs that are over 90% still fully intact. So that are, I mean, there's absolutely no question that these things are viruses, the remnants of viruses. See, these are a lot of assertions. No, we've already shown that these are not good lines of evidence, that they are 100% undeniable evidence that these were once from retroviruses. Quite the opposite. What we're seeing here is that, no, the solo LTRs are functional stretches of DNA, and your full ERVs, most of them, the ones that are functional and fixed, we'll get into that probably in the next videos, we're going to start winding down here a little bit. I want to keep these about an hour. <clears throat> and I think we got through a pretty good chunk here. This video is about 26 minutes. We're almost at the eight minute mark. And so the ERVs 
are created units of DNA function. That's what we're seeing here. And same with these solo LTRs. If you were a designer, you could incorporate similarities to the long terminal repeats, right? Your LTRs that are part of the ERVs or found as a solo element, which he is saying, oh, well, they're that way because of time and mutations and other processes like uh, retro transpositioning and uh, recombination, I think they would even look to. And so a designer, as God seems to have done, can take those similarities to the long terminal repeat of genomes to uh, eukaryotic organisms and incorporate them because they have important properties that make them ideally suited for sequences like, like promoters. Okay. And the fact that we find them isolated in hosts and associated with important functional roles tells us that they are simply functional stretches of DNA. And we share those with the chimpanzee and the gorilla and the orangutan and other primates for common design purposes. That's why all modes of transportation have engines in common, batteries in common. They have many important uh, components in common. And it's not because they evolved over time or they inherited them from a common Arctic sedan ancestor or a skateboard. No, it's good design. And so the designer could have intentionally incorporated these solo LTR sequences because they consist of a very specific design these uh, properties associated with them that make them uh, useful in particular settings. Okay. But John here is basically arguing that these solo LTRs got disassociated from the endogenous retrovirus over time, started off as a full ERV, but then over time mutations uh, hit the ERV. Mutations do happen. We do agree with that. Other uh, processes in the genome, other mechanisms. And so over time, all you're left with is what? The solo LTR. And then the solo LTR ends up in the apparently right, the perfect position, this integral position in order to function in the way it does, let's say as a promoter. And then now it's going to alter the gene expression profile of that gene, as in these. Solo LTRs that got disassociated from the ERVs for whatever reason, mutations in time. And now they have important biological consequences for the cell and for the organism. No, that's wishful thinking. That's imagination. Evolutionists hope, dream, and imagine that these kinds of arguments are going to convince an objective thinking person that we are related to chimpanzees and gorillas. No, these are put forth as the best arguments for common descent. But when you actually examine them, you see that they're not good evidence for common descent. And they provide us with incredible evidence for what? Common design and separate ancestry. In the human genome. And they're just there, like all of us have them. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. ERVs are bookended by long terminal repeats, just like retrovirus insertions. So that's right. And these long terminal repeats are uh, functional. They flank the, the sequences, but they also occur in, uh, in solo and they act in gene regulation. Okay. And so evolutionists largely in the past have assumed that ERVs are non-functional. They've assumed that the insertion mechanism is random and also the mutational events that occur in the genome and specifically the ERV sequences are also random. Okay, and we're gonna see that these are all faulty assumptions. Here, I've got the long terminal repeats. Up top is the ERV that's in, in the human genome. And then down below is a retrovirus genome, the RNA genome. And it's got one long terminal repeat on the right side here. It's got a tail there. And what happens is this enzyme called reverse transcriptase, when it's making a DNA copy of the chain of RNA, it actually copies that tail on both sides. And so the processed 
DNA genome of the virus has two tails, two long terminal repeats that are identical to each other because it actually, th that enzyme uses one to make the template for the other. So they're identical. And then that gets inserted. Now, if I understand the position correctly, basically, according to the story, when the when an exogenous retrovirus uh, infiltrates and it's passed on, or in fact, and it's passed on vertically through a germ cell line, well, it's now passed on to progeny. Every single cell has that viral DNA. So the LTRs at the start are identical, but over time they're hit with mutations. And so one LTR can be diverge from the other LTR. And that's how they're able to use molecular clocks to make uh, guesses, I believe, as to when these ERVs actually originated, when, when they took place. ...into the victim's genome. That is an obvious sign that there is a virus insertion that's happened, that you've got these repeating stretches of DNA on either end surrounding the virus protein. No, that's not obvious reasons why they're the result of past retroviral insertions. The long terminal repeat is an important component of the ERV. It's an important component of the retrovirus. The retrovirus is most likely originating from host genomes. Makes sense why they have the long terminal repeats in the first place. And the solo LTRs that are not part of a larger ERV serve important functional roles. And so nothing that we've seen so far in the first roughly nine minutes of this video, well edited, well put together. I do appreciate uh, the effort and work here by, by John. The visuals are great. They're helpful. But no evidence here that refutes the idea that God front-loaded living organisms with retroviral-like sequences. Protein encoding genes. And those can be several hundred to over a thousand nucleotides long, the long terminal repeats. It just kind of depends from different virus species to virus species how long that's going to be. Number three, retroviral integrase fingerprints are found before and after each ERV. So let me explain what that means. Here I've, I've colored in blue these little uh, ERV fingerprints or retrovirus fingerprints. And down below, I have the, the retrovirus genome here. So this is the DNA version, the processed version of the. So I gave a teaser of this earlier that your mechanism called retro transposition, where you have these transposable genetic elements. Okay. These mobile genetic elements, which are also referred to as in the conventional literature, jumping genes. They can move around the genome. They can go uh, move around on the same chromosome or also from one chromosome to another. And they leave behind, as they do this internally, sequences similar to what? Viral integrations. Okay, so no, these so-called signatures or scars that John here is assuming are the result of external infection where you have an exogenous retrovirus uh, infiltrating and then becoming an endogenous retrovirus if it's passed on. No, you're getting the same scars, you're getting the same marks. The mobile genetic elements that have similar makeups, okay, because you have retro elements in general, and I get there's different classes, LTR ones, non-LTR ones, you got signs, you got lines, you got uh, ERVs, okay, you've even got ALU sequences, but the point is they will leave behind sequences that are similar to viral integrations. And John is going to have a very difficult time proving or demonstrating sufficiently that these signatures or these fingerprints are due to external infection or external integration rather than marks and signatures simply being left behind by jumping genes and uh, transposons leaving their mark as they perform their functional role. So basically marks or signatures or fingerprints left behind due to internal movement and internal means.
a retrovirus genome. And below I have host DNA before insertion. So this is a, they haven't yet been infected by the virus. Well, what's gonna happen is that that little enzyme integrase that I've colored in red here in my, in my model, it's going to make a Z-shaped slice in your DNA. And then it's going to separate your DNA. So you've got this little. I've even read, because there's a lot of interesting information out here on the, these uh, technical topics. I have an active research project where I am actively researching and studying and model building when it comes to the topic of endogenous retroviruses, especially focusing on the bigger picture and building a model post flood and the integrations, both external and internal that have taken place, figuring out which ERVs are created, which ones are due to true ERVs. But I've even uh, read that DNA repair mechanisms, when DNA is damaged, you have these DNA repair enzymes and these DNA repair systems that can leave behind sequences when they're doing their, their job repairing damaged DNA that actually resemble viral insertions, even though a true viral integration event never happened. So there's a lot that can happen in the genome that can happen internally that leave behind these so-called fingerprints and scars and marks that don't have anything to do with an external infection. So this is more of an assertion and John here is not really dealing with counters. He's not presenting anything that's really discriminatory or differentiating in terms of the overall endogenous retrovirus debate. Jagged N on both sides. And if we were to zoom in on that, it would look like this. So that's, that's what the cut looks like. With Lucid, IT teams don't have to start from square one. Need a work order process? Disc and then the virus DNA will be inserted between those two cuts. And if we were to zoom in just on those two cuts and, and bring them in close to each other, we see, so here, the white here, those are the long-term. Okay, that is 10 minutes on the dot that we've we've gotten through. And that was fun. That was fun. So in just over an hour, we got through the first 10 minutes. The video is about 26 minutes. And so I do want to uh, finish this whole response in about two or three parts. And then if John uh, decides to re respond, which I think some of these evolutionists do need to respond. People like Vice Rhino, people like John Perry, because they're the ones that are going around saying that ERVs are as close to proof as as can be for why you are related to dogs and fish and banana plants and why the theory of common descent is true. And so they need to back up their claims, back up their arguments, and I am happy to respond as needed. Another video that I will uh, be getting to as well in the future is a video put out by Dr. Zach Hancock. He's responded to some of my arguments in uh, my book and in my lectures. And so, yes, I want to leave no stone unturned. We've addressed Vice Rhino. I'm addressing stated clearly here, and I am going to address hopefully all relevant videos associated with ERVs because we're going to take their best so-called arguments and we are going to dismantle them and we are going to leave them with no more ammo in terms of their uh, defense and uh, pushing this idea of evolution. And so, okay, I had fun. Again, I enjoy engaging the critics, especially when um, we're dealing with worthwhile responses like, like this one. And I appreciate that it's a well-edited, it's a good video. And uh, we've basically gone through two, we're on three, but I've already shown that these so-called fingerprints and scars and marks are also expected by internal means. There's things that can happen internally in the genome, retrotransposition being uh, one of them with these uh, transposons or jumping genes that leave the same marks. And so uh, John, as far as I know, doesn't point that out. He might in the coming minutes, I'm not sure. But guys, thanks for tuning in. Please share this around. On Standing for Truth Ministries, we want to leave no stone unturned. We want to address all arguments and we want to respond to all of the 
critics in a very sophisticated and thorough manner. And so thank you for watching this video. Share this around to your friends, your family on Facebook. Let's get the truth out there because guys, it is a great time to be a biblical creationist. God bless.